Hello everybody, I'm Elle McHugh, and today I'm going to be going over question number 6 from the 2003 Calc BC FRQ. Let's get started. The function f is defined by the power series f of x for all real numbers x. So part a tells us to find f prime of 0 and f prime prime of 0. That is the derivative of f at 0 and the second derivative of f at 0. To find f prime of 0, I first found f prime of x. To find f prime of x, I differentiated like I would for any other power series. I found the general term by using power rule, and then I found the expanded form. I went out to about four terms so that I could determine the pattern. Then I plugged in 0 for x, and I got f prime of 0 is equal to 0, because all of these terms with x cancel. To find f prime prime of 0, or the second derivative at x equals 0, I did the same thing. I got my final answer that the second derivative at x equals 0 is equal to negative 1 third. The answer key does not go into this much detail. All it states is that f prime of 0 is equal to the coefficient of the x term, which is equal to 0. And as you can see, there is no x term, so it is equal to 0. And then the second derivative at 0 is equal to 2, which is from the derivative of x squared times the coefficient of the x term, which is negative 1 over 3 factorial, and you also get negative 1 third, which is what I got doing the other method. Just remember that there are multiple ways of doing these problems, and that recognizing patterns does help to make it faster. The second part of part A asks to determine whether f has a local maximum, local minimum, or neither at x is equal to 0, and to give a reason for your answer. So because the derivative at x equals 0 is equal to 0, and the second derivative at x equals 0 is negative, as you can see, that means there is a local maximum. The first derivative tells us that we have a horizontal tangent line at x equals 0, and then the second derivative tells us that it is concave down. Therefore, it must have a shape resembling this, so it has a local maximum. Don't forget to put your answer in a sentence like they showed, as you get a point for the reason. So, part B asks us to show that 1 minus 1 over 3 factorial approximates f of 1 with error less than 1 over 100. So the first thing you want to recognize is that f of x is an alternating series, as you can see, by this negative 1 to the n power. This means that we are going to use the alternating series error to show that the error is less than 1 over 100. So the first thing you want to recognize is that f of 1 is equal to 1 minus 1 over 3 factorial when you approximate the series to two terms. Because it's an alternating series, you want to go to the next term, which is 1 over 5 factorial. Now, using this term, you can determine if the error is less than 1 over 100. So, to do this, you recognize that the error has to be less than or equal to the next term in the series. Then you find what this is equal to. And now you know that 1 over 120 is less than 1 over 100. Therefore, the error has to be less than 1 over 100. So don't forget to state that this is an alternating series. And to do this, you must also state that it is decreasing and has an absolute value limit as n approaches infinity equal to 0. These are the properties that ensure it is an alternating series. And there you have the numerical evidence for why the error is less than 1 over 100. Some common mistakes include using the 1 over 3 factorial term instead of the 1 over 5 factorial term, but just remember that with an alternating series, you always use the term after what is included in your estimation. So, here comes the fun part. Part C. Part C asks us to show that y is equal to f of x is, e is a solution to the differential equation x y prime plus y is equal to cosine of x. So looking at this, I was quite intimidated, but then I realized just using the series form, I can find y prime, then I can multiply that by x, 
and then I can add y, and this is exactly what they did. First, they just found y prime in expanded form as well as the general term, and then they multiplied by x, adding 1 to the exponent of x, and then they added y. This looks very confusing, but all they did is group together the terms that had similar x powers. For example, they grouped together the coefficients that are in front of the x squared term for x, y prime, and y. They also did this for the general term. Then all they did was simplify this, and as you can see, it handily comes out to be cosine of x. For the Calc BC test, everybody should be familiar with some commonly used Taylor series. These include the very basic 1 over 1 minus x, to the more complicated and the things you should definitely memorize, e to the x, cosine x, sine x, tangent inverse, and ln of 1 plus x. All students should at least know the series form, but it would be very beneficial, as seen in this FRQ question, to be able to recognize the expanded form. In this case, we use the expanded form for cosine of x. The rest of this worksheet can be found on Mr. Farrar's website, and I would recommend checking it out if you want to review your Taylor series, or your power series in general. So, I found the other way that they interpreted this problem to be quite interesting. What they did is that they recognized that the derivative of xy is equal to xy prime plus y. From there, they set xy equal to x f of x. Then they wrote out the series for x f of x. They saw that this was equal to sine of x. Then from there, they derived it to get cosine of x. Something to always remember is that when you're looking at these calc FRQs, that sometimes they hide patterns. And as you can see, this method has a lot less steps than the other one. So when you're going through your work, if you see a derivative that you recognize, an antiderivative, something that we should know the formula of, take advantage of this pattern. So that's all I have. I hope this was beneficial. There are links in the description for extra practice problems and other resources. And good luck on your BC test. Ding, ding.